So please take a seat. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to propose to you that we start this session with a look at how therapeutic design and generation is being transformed. And I would like to start with you, Peter. We have heard a lot this morning about new thinking and new approaches to healthcare that improve patients' lives in a whole range of eras. One of the big moves, obviously, is towards personalized medicine. And I would like you to tell us how this impacts what you do at Biogen. Sure, well, thank you. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, one of the most important things I think you heard is that, is that we are on sort of the cusp of a, of a, of a, of a true revolution. Um, so I'm a neurologist as well as, um, as, as well as an internist, as well as um, sort of a techno geek, and probably old enough that I built my first uh, cat's whisker crystal radio, uh, for those of you that know what that technology is, um, a long time ago. Um, personalized personalized medicine is what the human body does. So the beauty of what Dr. Herr said is that it's really about just now doing with technology what Mother Nature has been doing for really 3.7 billion years. We've had nervous systems since, um, since the early sponge and maybe the hydra about 455 million years. And we are just now learning to be able to do the kinds of things um, in technology that nature has been doing both at the cellular level and at the nervous system level. Once we start to think about that, once we start, start to think about, and, 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 and the most remarkable augmentation about the human being is that we live much, much longer than our our biological origins intend us. We're only genetically supposed to live until we reproduce and then go away. So the fact of the matter is neurodegeneration, uh, the, internal, the internal problems of aging, um, these are near and dear to many of us, some more than others um, at this particular point in our lives, but we like the idea of living longer and having our wisdom and having our experiences as being something um, which is particularly beneficial. So that's really why personalized medicine matters. And the, the fact is that at a place like Biogen, where we focus on neurological disease, we do it at two ends. One is in the neurodevelopmental disorders. So a new drug, Spinraza, which has now been on the market, helps children that would die because they, their nervous systems start to develop and then they fail, and they would die by two. Now by manipulating their, their, genetic, um, their, their genetic signaling, these kids are growing up to be, uh, or they've started to grow up to be children, and uh, we presume that they will continue on that and grow up and grow into adulthood. And on the other end, um, the children the, the children who are grown, who then reach um, the dementing age of about 35 and then it's downhill, um, are very interested in maintaining uh, their ability to, to continue. So it's the fine-tuned ability to know what is what do we measure in somebody, how do we understand that, um, and then how do we manipulate that, that I think is really where the future is. Digital lets us do that. It closes the distance. It gives us it gives us a resolution, and it lets us provide in context a tremendous understanding of whether the drug works or whether the adaptation of the system works, whether we can manipulate the environment. These are all things that digital does. That's what the nervous system that has been doing for 500 million years, and the fact that we can tune it and tune it better. That's really the future. Thanks a lot, Peter. I would like to turn to you, Pierre Yves and to ask how important you see the shift towards personalized therapies in clinical trials and what is the impact of remote operations there? Sure. Um, so first thing is, uh, while I, I thought uh, it was adopted very, very quickly by the industry, what I came to realize it's, uh, it's, it's that uh, from Dr. Uh, Natwani is that uh, we're far from a, a fast adoption compared to Pokemon Go. Ah. Um, but we are seeing it... Uh, having a tremendous impact and uh, and uh, of course digital biomarkers are, are all over the place but uh, what we see is that uh, uh, for instance in our case we focus on electrophysiology uh, they're having an impact because uh, it just speeds up the process significantly and so and so by focusing on, on uh, personalized therapies uh, we can have the right treatment reach the patient much faster. And so to give you an example, in epilepsy, it takes on average three to five years for the right patient to receive the right treatment and be stabilized. Now, if you had an approach where you had a personalized therapy with digital biomarkers, with a companion diagnostics and the drug together, that you could speed up that uh, from, from years to just weeks. So it has a tremendous impact. 
Thanks a lot. And you, Eric, can you share one example of better outcome as a result of personalization? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of examples, but one one of the more uh, direct ones is, of course, the ability to be able to print customized implants and and ability ability to scan a patient's damage, um, fix it on in a software, and then be able to print out that fix or that uh, that solution and implant it into the patient after. So I think the um, uh, of course, the merging between the software, uh, 3D printing industries, and uh, anything in between there is something that's gonna see, we're going to see a lot of development in the next coming years. Um, personalized medicine is definitely an area that, that we at Selink are focusing heavily on, so I see it's major growth areas. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And I would like to stay with you with my next question. And actually, I would like you to tell us a bit more about the innovations that you see coming in 3D imaging and 3D bioprinting. Yeah, so, so, it's, so it's a really exciting area, and I know we're, we're focusing a lot on software, and software is, is an essential component to, to 3D printing. I, I think everybody in here is, is familiar with 3D printing. Uh, we'll do a really quick hand raising. Have it, has anyone here heard about 3D printing? <laughs> Half. <laughs> I know there's more. Um, but it's an exciting industry that's growing very rapidly, and, and I've seen it on a few slides previously. Um, there's also a field called bioprinting. And bioprinting is essentially taking it to, it to a whole new level where you're uh, not only printing personalized implants, but you're also including the human cells. So you can take cells from the patient, you can expand them, you can put in with a new biomaterial, you can print it out using a bioprinter, and then eventually in the future you should be able to implant this into the patient. So first of all, you get rid of the rejection of the implant because you're using the patient's own cells. Uh, but second of all, of course, the fitting of that implant is, is, is ideal. Um, and I think also in another application which is very exciting today, in which our technology is actually implemented today, is, is um, taking the patient's own cells. So for instance, taking a, a biopsy from a, from a cancer tumor, uh, expand, that, uh, expand those cells, place them inside of a novel biomaterial. Uh, you can even take an, an image or an MRI scan of, of the tissue they want to print. Uh, print it out with a bioprinter and then use that in your uh, drug discovery process. So as you're developing a new drug, you can test this drug on, on the patient-specific tissue and patient-specific uh, patient cells. Um, and, and this is even prior to going into preclinical studies, so even using, before using animals. Uh, so it's a very exciting area. Uh, it, it's a combination of software and, and also the hardware. Um, but, but we definitely see the personalized aspect is, is essential. And, and we see that a lot of pharmaceutical companies that we're working with today, and we're working with the, with, with the majority of the top, top 20 uh, pharmaceutical business, um, uh, companies today, uh, where they're utilizing this type of, of, of bioprinting technology for, for a wide range of both personalized but also more mass, um, mass areas. Thanks a lot. That's, that's very impressive. I would like to turn to you, Peter. You're also using 3D technologies. I don't know if you're using 3D bioprinting yet, but you're using a lot of 3D technologies. So do you want to share a little bit more about that and what is the most important according to you? Sure. So, um, so we're not yet using um, 3D printing, um, at least not um, in the bioprinting space. It, it certainly is. I, I mean, I will tell you that um, if, if there were any Biogen um, folks from my, from my device, part of the, of the business say, well, come, come on, we do this all the time. We, do, we use 3D printing constantly for prototyping, and you know, most, of, most of Biogen's molecules are given parenterally or given subcutaneously. And so there's a tremendous design cycle, and the, and the 3D printer, the 3D printer and, and the 3D printing technology um, is really critical um, for, um, for, for, moving, for moving device and drug delivery um, forward. So that's certainly one, uh, one area. Um, but I would say that for us, 3D is, is bigger. So I, I run a group, Digital and Quantitative Medicine. And for us, Digital and Quantitative Medicine really is thinking in 4D. So we're thinking in a dynamic space, um, but we're thinking, in terms of, we're thinking in terms of space, and we really, think, we really do think in terms of space-time. So we have a, we've made a, a large investment um, over the years. I've been at Biogen, and I was at a, another smaller um, a pharmaceutical company, well, actually much larger, actually, a pharmaceutical company. We were involved in virtual reality, and in fact, that's in, in Interesting enough, where we first had our, our, our contact with Dassault, uh, because we were we were involved early on in the Living Heart Project as a way of bringing pharmaceutical views to this really wonderful um, tool of, of the biomechanics of the living heart. 
So today, um, we are involved in, in understanding the, the anatomical and the anatomical chemical construct of the brain. So from a 3D standpoint, that really is, is, is how one does neuroscience. The key to neurology and the key to, key to neuroscience is that the brain is an anatomical structure. So it's not like a liver, which can be treated as a homogeneous, uh, you know, as sort of a homogeneous phase. Um, but really, you have to actually treat the three-dimensional structure and then the temporal response of that three-dimensional structure. And so it's critical to be able to model that, to be able to understand it, and to be able to measure in that, in that space. So that's the way, that, that's the way we, we work. Um, it's actually how we think. It's how we, we conceive, the, conceive the work we do. It's how we do the measures. It's how we map the state of the patient onto the actual target space and circuit space of the brain. And so it's fundamental to, um, to, the, to the sort of biogen uh, intellect and, the, and the, way that, the way that we solve problems. Thanks a lot. With that, I would like to, to turn to you, Pierre-Yves. Um, Peter, you've been describing the work you're doing in 3D uh, virtual plus real with the SOS system tools, and I would like to turn to you, Pierre-Yves. Are you also leveraging the SOS system tools? Is it in virtual plus real, or what else are you doing, and how does it help you solve your business problems? Yeah, we're, we're, we've, we've been uh, adopting the SOS systems uh, software since the, the very beginning of the company. Uh, one uh, very exciting thing that we're doing right now is, uh, is for instance, to, to, to think about uh, sensor placement, uh, but also how different bodies uh, will r r yield different y uh, signals. Uh, on our sensors, and so, uh, for instance, we're trying to uh, solve a problem in uh, in cardio uh, tocography right now. Um, so. Uh, when a mother is pregnant, can you record the fetal ECG? Now that's very difficult because those, those are kind of patients that are not uh, easily accessed to uh, in clinical trials. Um, but also the, um, the, sh the ever-changing uh, size of the fetus uh, but, uh, uh, makes it particularly complex. And so we used some of Dassault Systems tools to modelize what happens when the organs change, when, uh, w when the signals go through different uh, types of material. And that helps us better understand how many sensors we need to position, uh, where we need to position, position them, and how it's going to change over the time. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And with that, I would like to stay with you. And maybe we can go more broadly on the diagnosis field. And I would like you to um, explain to us how you are helping patients and doctors to collaborate better and share data that ultimately change patient experience. Right. So one of the challenges, and I think it's been addressed uh, by previous speakers, but one of the challenges in digital healthcare is you need to have a lot of people uh, working together and collaborating. And uh, so uh, our solutions um, well, we started as a wearable company. We actually uh, cover a lot of telemedicine and uh, electronic patient reported outcome. And so we have solutions uh, to allow the patients to report information to the doctors, but also to, for the doctors to collaborate on a specific case. Uh, as we started in epilepsy, that's particularly interesting as um, we see uh, a shortage of uh, specialists in the field and uh, doctors needed to, to talk about specific cases with each other. So for instance, uh, 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 epileptologist that focuses on adult EEG might not necessarily know how to read pediatric EEG and then when they receive a pediatric patient, can they then share that case uh, to uh, to a specialist and discuss about that about that. We're, so that first part is covered. We do that very well right now. We have over 200 uh, hospitals using our solution. Um, we're moving forward with uh, with uh, AI as well uh, to help replicate that experience of the uh, remote expert helping you read their information, and that's particularly interesting in areas where there are shortages of specialists, and as well helps uh, reduce uh, healthcare costs. You go. Yep. Awesome. Do you want to tell us a bit more about the, that, the, the kind of data science that you would be doing then? Uh, sure. So, I mean, uh, the EEG is, uh, is, is a non-stereotypical type of data. So uh, we combine uh, for our AI, we don't, uh, well, we wish we had the data sets to do uh, deep learning. Uh, we do not. Uh, and it's just not available right now or the quality of the data is too poor. So we combine, we, we mix... Um, 
uh, the guidelines, expert system, signal processing, and then, uh, and then at the very end, uh, you add the machine learning to help uh, replicate uh, th the best. That actually has a, so not only are we able to, to uh, therefore replicate the best, best expertise and put it out there, uh, but it also helps us, because we're using the guidelines, to push uh, the guidelines out in the field as fast as possible and, and help them be adopted by hospitals much faster than in the past. Thanks a lot, Pierre-Yves. Eric, I would like to turn to you. We've discussed with Pierre-Yves and with Peter how, what they are getting from working with the SO system. May I also ask you what you expect from our uh, collaboration with the SO system? Absolutely. So um, uh, we. Uh, we use the Sol Systems products in, in, in multiple different ways. So, so uh, first of all, of course, the most obvious one is design of our products, design of our, our systems, taking it all the way from an idea stage um, to, to the final product, manufacturing, and then out to customers. So we, we design and, and, and make the printers. Uh, we will make all that in, uh, majority of that is made in, in, in Europe, and some is in uh, manufacturing in America. Um, but the Dassault system softwares are, are playing a vital role for us to rapidly being able to, to design these types of products and, and, and stay at the head of the innovation curve. Um, but then also from the second standpoint is for customers and, and also for what people are using uh, these printers and, and materials for. So for instance, if you want to print a, a small piece of a human liver, uh, of course, first of all, you, you would want to get this um, model from the patient's uh, own tissue through a, um, through a scan, uh, an MRI scan. You would take this image, you can convert to an SDL file, import an SDL, SDL file into and to the SALT software, uh, and you can start doing imaging of, of, of that tissue. Uh, next thing, you could do simulations of that tissue and really understand where the challenge is. You could compare uh, diseased tissue to healthy tissue and really understand what is, uh, where is your you know, pinpoint problems. You, you pinpoint that. And then the last step, you can save that file, export it to the printer, and then print out that tissue, whether it's the diseased part or it's the healthy part. Uh, and then, of course, if you're a pharma company, you can then utilize that tissue and test your new drug. Uh, if it comes more for the for the implant side, uh, it will be the same thing. Get a scan from the patient, scan the uh, the defect, whether let's say it's a meniscus, uh, you can scan that defective meniscus. You import it into the software, you can repair it, uh, and then you can print out that same uh, same tissue using a bioprinter or 3D printer. So, so I think the these softwares are extremely helpful in terms of both from the design perspective and also how our our customers and how our, our researchers are working today. Um, there's also the opportunity of saving these files and sharing them around the world through a collaborative network um, and repository essentially of, of disease or healthy tissues that, that other scientists around the, around the planet can utilize for, um, for different bioprinting experiments. Thanks a lot. You've been mentioning simulation, and I would like to finish this customer panel by going back to you, Peter. We started about talking about virtual discovery, and I would like to close the loop. You've been mentioning what you're doing in 3D uh, modeling, virtual discovery. Then the question is, how do you make it real? Could you a little bit elaborate on what you said, virtual plus real? How do you make the connection? So, um, so I'll give you, I, maybe I'll give you the best example of how we think about the, the 3D experience, the, and I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the 3D experience and add the 4D, and then how do we bring that to a patient, or how do, we, how, do we, how do we bring it into drug discovery? So probably the most exciting thing that we're doing um, deals with the fact that there's a whole class of, 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 of drugs now, the ASOs, these are, these are RNA molecules, that can manipulate the genome and can, and can, change, the, and can change the cell. Output. So, um, Biogen, along with I, uh, with our partner Ionis, but there are many, many companies that are doing this type of work. Um, and uh, and I'll say what I'm about to say is, is, it, is it also correlates to to things like gene therapies. One of the problems that you have is you need to understand how do you take these large molecules and how do you get them to the right place in the body. So there's the there's the piece of personalization. So one of the one of the things that we're working with Dassault on is to actually say, well, what if we could completely um, um, model on a dynamic basis the PK and PD, so the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the molecules that we're giving. Um, 
right now, if you're going to give an ASO to this into the central nervous system, you give it intrathecally. And that means you do a spinal tap and you inject, the fl you inject the drug into the cerebral spinal fluid where it flows around the brain. And then it flows through the brain and through very, very complicated physical chemistry that frankly, um, we don't really even understand fully. Um, it undergoes a whole series of absorptions and then biological processes where it eventually gets to its, to its targets. Well, the critical, ex the critical component for the patient is the, the exposure, the exposure of the drug to the correct tissue at the right time and knowing that you can get it there. We don't really know how to do that. We've been lucky. In Spinraza, there's a drug that was given for spinal muscular atrophy, which is a disease really of the spinal cord. So it turns out if you give the drug to the spinal cord or to near the spinal cord, it worked very well to the, to the fortune of, 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 uh, of the children and, and even the adults that, that we're doing this with. But now the technology is moving into, into all sorts of other targets in the dementing diseases. So they're up in the brain, diseases potentially like Parkinson's or, or progressive supranuclear palsy. These are diseases not of the spinal cord and they're not nearby. And so to understand how to do simulation and, how to under, and understand how to do that in a way that you can get the right dose at the right time to the right tissue is really the challenge. And so this is, this is right, right now where when we talk about modeling and simulation and talk about bringing it to the patient, it will both tell you how to design the drug, it'll tell you how to deliver the drug, it eventually will tell us what patient to give the drug and at what dose and at what time interval. That will really personalize, will personalize the experience for the patient. Um, and it's critical because that's really where, um, where we'll, make the, we'll make the advances in clinical trial time and in drug dosing and therefore safety and then patient Thanks a lot. As a conclusion for the audience, I would like each of you guys, if you can think about the message you would leave the audience with in one sentence. Can I ask you to do that? Maybe I will start with you, Pierre-Yves. Uh, sure. I mean, my message is, uh, I think uh, we all see that it's coming. Uh, it's going to happen. But, uh, you know, the I while the idea is important, I mean, the key is the execution. And so uh, for that, we need an ecosystem. We need the patients. We need the, f the big pharmas. We need the med medical device industry. We need the software. We need everybody to come and, and work together. And so uh, I think my message is just come join us. Thanks. I think that's uh, very well said. So <laughs> it's a hard act to follow. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, I think I agree. Uh, what I hear here is, is a lot of amazing ideas and a lot, a lot of amazing things are happening around the world. Um, I think these types of venues are important to have. And, and after this, as you're saying, execution is important. So after this, people should set up collaborations. I mean, I want to work with both of you. So <laughs> I'll leave it with that. So let me raise the ante. It's not coming, it's here. The question is how fast and how quickly do we do this and why? Because when, in our business anyway, it's about patience and that's all of us. It's really about what is the fastest way to use the computational tools and the skills and the engineering tools that we've been de developing over just several hundred years. Now, finally, we're at that moment where it's like a well-focused lens. We are ready to move forward at an incredible speed. And the only thing that's stopping us is our inability to work together. We need to do that better. And really, the patience, for me, that's the patience are waiting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Congratulations.